Okay, well, here, what I'm going to talk to you about, this is the last talk of the day, uh, is a little bit of prehistory and then up to the current time of GSAS II. Um, a little bit, you can sort of tell in the evolution of the icon. Uh, this was a sort of a hand-drawn thing that I created many years ago because you always need an icon for software. And this one is a uh, molecular drawing made by GSAS II. And the chemists in the group here c might be able to recognize that as the high explosive PETN. Uh, its long name is pentaerythral tetranitrate. Um, anyway, and the reason why, well, it's a nice picture, but the reason why it's sort of, it's sort of dear to my heart is that when I was at Los Alamos, I did high pressure experiments on a high explosive, <laughs> which is uh, interesting. Okay, so where did all my experience start with this? Well, in the early 1970s, I was a postdoc at Oxford University working in inorganic chemistry for J.S. Anderson trying to do electron microscopy. Now my eyes weren't good enough to do electron microscopy because you had to do all of the focusing business by looking at the image and manipulating the magnets. So <coughs> somewhere in the middle of that, Tony Cheatham, who was also a postdoc working for Brian Fender, came around and said to me, he says, Bob, how would you like to do some neutron powder diffraction? And so I said, sure, why not? Um, and oh, by the way, I have this new program, which is, this is the manual for it. This is the original manual of the program as modified by Alan Hewitt. And I'll get to this in a minute. Um, and we did experiments at the Panda diffractometer, which we heard reference to earlier which I believe is situated down here in this little pit on t uh, next to the reactor face, which is sort of around this way. Um, and I'll give it a little few details about it. The samples were titanium niobium oxides, and I'll show a picture in a second. Uh, the data collection was characteristics are here. It was about one and a half angstroms. That's sort of that magic number that everybody uses. And Tony's comment at the time was, what we ought to do is to take the monochromator and back it all the way around to the highest angle we could put it to, and that way improve the resolution. Um, so we said, sure, OK. The scan time was 50 minutes per degree. Now do the math. That's three days of data collection per sample. Uh, and there's that book. And the important thing about this particular book is that it has my annotations for the adaptions and the changes that I had to make to that program to get it to work on these particular problems. Uh, and it ran on this thing. <laughs> uh, the details of it, this is, a, this is the English equivalent of an IBM uh, 700 ser 7000 series machine, so-called ICL 1906A. This is the one that's at Harwell. There was a very similar one at Oxford uh, on the Banbury Road. Um, <laughs> This is its characteristics, 256 kilobytes, 24-bit words. That's around 800 kilobytes. Um, the operating systems were George III and George IV, which I always thought of amusing as an American. Uh, this thing produced a megawatt of heat. Um, and it's got as much compute power as an old cell phone does nowadays. I mean, an old cell phone. Um, and so that was what it ran on. And because of this memory, we couldn't use very large arrays. So the samples that we were looking at were these things. Um, <coughs> this is a titanium and niobium oxide. The issue that we were trying to address is where's the titanium? And since titanium has a negative neutron scattering length and Niobium has a fairly large positive one. It should be relatively easy to sort out where it is. And that's what we did uh, with Reed Belt refinement. Um, the problem, whoops, the problem was that um, the program, as written by, Al, uh, by um, Hugo, only handled 300 reflections or less. And the memory of the machine wasn't big enough to handle 
600 or 700 reflect or 800 reflections like it was for that one. You simply couldn't make it that big. So I had to extensively modify the program in order to be able to handle this kind of situation. Uh, so that's my first diving into the Rietveld program and doing something with it. And that book is, has my annotations as to the changes that were made. Um, these two structures uh, were probably the largest structures done by powder diffraction for 20 or 30 years after their publication, something like that, until very rec fairly recently. Uh, it's a little bit of a cheat because the uh, structures are two dimensions, just two dimensional, because the atoms all lie on mirror planes, so one parameter is fixed, and so you just have two, two variables for each one. Uh, but we found out where the niobiums are. Um, now, that program is this one. Um, with Alan Hewitt made modifications to Hugo's program, uh, which was originally written first in Algol and then in Fortran. And what Alan had done was he added the refinement of anisotropic temperature factors. And that's what that book is about. Um, <coughs> I took it and made it work on bigger problems, which is what this one is, and added x-rays, and I couldn't get it to work. Uh, I couldn't get it to fit. And we heard about this earlier, and the problem was principally the peak shape. Um, I didn't have a decent description of it. So when I got back to Arizona State after this um, trip and visit in Oxford, um, I handed a copy of the program off to Ray Young. And he and his students and postdocs took it and created something called DBW and DBWS, which was very widely used by the community because it first ran on a PC. Um, <coughs> I also then took this same program when I went back to Rutherford for a sabbatical leave in, in early 80s and made it do neutron time of flight. Um, and that was the first Rietveld program that would actually work with neutron time of flight data. And that I handed off to the folks here at Argonne, and it was then adapted by Frank Rotella to work on a VAX. Uh, and so that's the, the original for that. Um, the, fo the folks at Georgia Tech then rewrote pieces of it and added stuff to it and added graphics to it. Um, and the, the source of and, and it and perhaps this one as well, became the source of a number of other reed belt refinement programs scattered around, including FullProf. So that's the, the, the structure of FullProf and it's the code words and all that sort of stuff actually derives its history back up through this tree to Hugo reed belt's original program. So, yeah. Okay. In 1982, uh, I was still at Arizona State, and summers in Phoenix are exceedingly hot. And there's no reason to stay in Phoenix in the summertime if you can avoid it. So uh, we moved to Los Alamos every summer for five summers in a row to escape the heat. And Los Alamos very kindly paid me to be a consultant. And one of the things that they asked um, Alan Larson and myself to do was to support the calculations associated with both single crystal diffraction and powder diffraction at neutron time of flight sources because you know, I knew something about that and Alan certainly know, knew about single crystals. Well, rather than using the old programs, we said let's start over because after all the mathematics is the same. So why not just write one program to do both? Single crystals and powder diffraction. So that led to the development of GSAS, otherwise known as the General Structure Analysis System. And oh, by the way, we wrangled over the name of this thing for about a week before we setting, set on something that had a decent uh, uh, phrase associated with it, GSAS. Um, <coughs> it was written for in Vax Fortran. Uh, the file structure is something called ISAM, Index Sequential Access Method. That's the construction of the ex so-called experiment file. Uh, it was all batch process calculations. Um, 
and it was designed from scratch to be multi-data because that's what neutron time of flight instruments give you. You have multiple detectors, you get multiple data sets. Single crystals, of course, are obviously multiple data sets because you get a set of reflections for each orientation of the crystal. So it had to work with multiple data, and if you're doing to do a powder diffraction analysis program, you have to do multiple phases because that's samples come that way. So this thing was really complex for the input file, was now known as the experiment file. So we had to write something that would allow the user to put the right numbers into that control file without errors so that they would have some success at being able to run the program successfully. So that's the source of this thing called EXPEDT, and it's, as I said here, it's all about taming that control file. And this is the interface. It's a text interface with menu items, and this in the 1980s was state-of-the-art. If you go, if you remembered, those of you who have been around long enough, what programs looked like on those kinds of machines, they were all this kind of an interface. Uh, if you were lucky, or there might not have been anything at all. Um, later on, Brian Toby, in, in the 1990s, wrote something called EXP GUI, which was a more modern interface using you know, that looked like this, and it had all the sorts of GUI stuff that we now love, and maybe some hate, of uh, pull downs and menus and buttons and text boxes and stuff like that. And this program basically did fundamental crystallographic calculations, namely least squares refinement, Fourier maps, uh, drawings of crystal structures, and geometry calculations, distances and angles, and whatnot. There was absolutely nothing for solving crystal structures. You had to do that somewhere else. <coughs> uh, in the subsequent couple decades of development, and by the way, that's a key word in here, is, is that this thing was not a static piece of software from 1986. It expanded considerably over the following 20, 20 years or so. Of it went from Vax Fortran to running on uh, Silicon Graphics IRIX machines, which is a variation of Unix. Um, I had to write some emulation for the ISAM. It then got shifted to PCs and OS X for Macintoshes. So it sort of it went through this evolutionary process of shifting from one operating system flavor to another. Uh, it also had included into it the natural sorts of things, so constant wavelength neutrons and constant wavelength x-rays and also something for energy dispersive x-rays. A big thing was as the literature, as other people found proper descriptions for line shapes and profiles, I tried to put them into the code as much as I possibly could. And so there's a tremendous amount of development in fitting of, of profiles and extracting out things like microstrain and size uh, and macroscopic strain and whatnot. Uh, along the way, also, I was responsible for a powder diffractometer at Los Alamos that was sort of a natural for doing texture analysis. So I had to I spent some time with spherical harmonics. Uh, <coughs> and then, of course, there's the business about powder diffraction in proteins, and that was basically uh, just a challenge. Uh, and oddly enough, it worked. Um, oops. Wait a minute. Get lost here. Uh, GSAS, the old GSAS was fairly easily scripted, and lots of people did use it in that sort of me method. It was documented. There was a manual. Uh, which was the only way people could cite it, and I think by now this number is probably somewhere closer to 8,000 citations to the, the original GSAS. But it had reached the limits on the design of nine phases and 99 histograms. Uh, people wanted 15 hist phases. They wanted 200 histograms. They wanted this. They wanted that. So, and there wasn't any way to to go beyond those limits, because that was inherent in the design of the uh, text file, input file. The interface, both of these, were clearly dated. 
the first one especially. Um, modern users don't like to use a keyboard. They want to use a mouse um, as much as possible. It had no tools for indexing powder patterns or solving crystal structures. Um, modern data comes all sometimes in 2D detectors, and there wasn't anything for processing that. And the stuff that was out there for doing that kind of work was as old as the original GSAS, 20 plus years old. Um, and so we really needed a new tool for modern crystallography, and that's GSAS 2. Uh, right. So this is a fresh start. And the dates on this is I began working on this in 2008. Um, and so the first usable version showed up in late 2011, early 2012. Now note the amount of time that it takes to go from here to here to get a first version. It's, it's a couple of years of concentrated effort in order to produce programs like this. Um, the only other comment I'd make about this, and you can sort of read all the rest of this, uh, is that the object was to get everything into it. Um, improve, make it open source, which led to Python. So at, in November of 2008, uh, I was uh, 64 years old, and that's when I learned Python. So there's hope for everybody. <laughs> <coughs> it was intended to be have a full modern graphical user interface with a native look and feel. In other words, what you saw on the screen is what it would look like on any other piece of software that was written for, say, Windows or Macintosh or Linux, as it would look like the local interface. No limits. The same as the old program, the old program it would do single crystals and powders, X-rays and neutrons. And I would wanted to add in incommensurate structures and be able to do small angle scattering and stacking faults because that's a sort of natural extensions to what happens with powder diffraction. Um, and finally, to enable doing parametric analysis, which is really the basis of modern crystallography. This is where you do an experiment under a changing conditions, so which we heard all about this morning. Um, and you want to be able to extract out not only how, what the structure was at each step of the way, but how the parameters varied from one pattern to the next, as and, and also try to attach some sort of physical law to that particular change, and identify the coefficient that describes how, say, a lattice parameter changes with temperature, thermal expansion. Um, <coughs> so for the image calibration, uh, First of all, uh, there is this, uh, th th what the issue is, is what you have is a, con is a conical section. And that's where the intercept of the detector plane to the, the uh, diffraction cone. That's a conic section. And the description of the shape of the conic section is actually due to a Belgian by the name of Dandelin, who published this in 1822. So this is not new mathematics. It's, in fact, exceedingly old mathematics. Um, but the upshot of it is that the axis of the cone, which is the incident beam direction, does not intercept the ellipse at the center of the ellipse. It's offset slightly. And there are some programs, namely that one, that makes the mistake of assuming that the center of the ellipse is where the incident beam goes. Uh, it's just wrong. And it's been wrong for two centuries. Um, <coughs> and anyway, here's proof. proof. Uh, this is uh, de detector data that was collected here with the thing tilted 45 degrees to the incident beam. And uh, the representation is absolutely spot on. Uh, and even one can do this ex extreme case where the conic section becomes a hyperbola, which is what happens out here. And nonetheless, it, it actually is able to extract out the intensity. It's perfectly fine, even for a highly tilted detector. Um, 
After you do the image process in, in GSAS 2, you can then simply stay in the project and just continue on with powder diffraction or small angle scattering or generate PDFs or whatever else you want to do with them. You don't have to take your data uh, that you've created inside the program from the 2D image, uh, have it punched out in some sort of disk file, which is then read by some other program, and you have to make sure the formats match, et cetera, et cetera. It's all in the same place. <coughs> so here's a case of indexing. The algorithm is that of Alan Coelho, and it works for everything from uh, cubic all the way to triclinic. Um, and then once you have extracted the intensities, you can do charge flipping to solve the crystal structure, which uh, requires no information about the symmetry. You just need a set of structure factors. Um, and the steps just go through to uh, do the charge flip and get the atom positions and then pick out the atoms that belong, that are the unique ones, and then do the refinement, and you're all done. And by the way, the graphics, the drawings of those are all done inside GSAS 2. Now, some people have occasionally asked, well, why did you use Python? Well, probably the easiest way to explain this is that the, so the software that does this drawings of these crystal structures, I wrote it in three weeks. And I can't think of any other language in which you could sit down and write that kind of stuff in three weeks, period. It just would not be possible. <coughs> uh, I'm going to skip this and go to here, which is actually the result of that. Um, this is a, a suite of data, which is 800 powder patterns taken at a, a, a diffractometer at SNS. Um, and so this is, this is not a 99 histogram limit anymore. Um, this is 800 of them. And it's simply tracking, whoops, uh, it's tracking what's happened by taking a sample and doing this to it uh, uh, as a function of time, about a dozen, eight or 10 cycles of uh, flexing the sample. Um, and when you do that, you can then fit the positions of the peaks um, and come up with a sequence, and you can see here that this is the position of one of the reflections is showing the response to the, to the load, the changing load on the sample uh, as a function of time. And this one is a, a response in the intensity of, the ref of a couple of reflections as a function of time. The dropouts are when the beam went off at the SNS. Uh, the wiggles are because under the applying the load, there's a grain reorientation, so it's representing a change in the texture of the steel bar as a function of load. Uh, and you can see that there's a couple things going on here. One is, is that it's not just simple oscillation, there's a bit of a fade because this stuff is being slowly disordered. Uh, and you can also see that here, as you can see how there's the response is getting worse and worse as it's beginning to fail under the repeated load. Um, this is only in here for yawn. <laughs> but you can do things like size distribution um, uh, from uh, small angle scattering data and then do a fit and come up with a size. Uh, in this case, the stuff is bimodal for alumina polishing powder. Um, you can do sequential analysis where you've got a series of patterns. Uh, do the fitting, there's one. And then here's the result of a bunch of them. And you can find out, in this particular case, how the volume changed, the vo sample volume changed with the uh, um, preparation. Um, it also will deal with incommensurate structures. And here's, in fact, a display of uh, sodium carbonate. And, uh, I th somebody showed a picture of this thing. I guess it was you or Dave, yeah. one of you guys. Yeah, Tim, you had you had the had you had a little movie of it moving. Well, Cheesehouse will produce that same movie. Um, <coughs> whoops, I don't want to go there quite there yet. And so here's actually the fluctuation in the position of um, one of the sodium atoms along along the y-axis uh, by the by the modulation. And with that, I want to thank you. <laughs>